Jesus Christ. Now you might be wondering what the get up is about, what it's all about, and this is what I believe in. This is the life Jesus Christ is desiring to give us today. So we all wonder in our lives growing up, what does God look like? Right? And many people have the image of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, dying and suffering for the sins of the world, for your sins. And there was a time when he was doing that. But there is also comes a time when, when he died, and there was the burial, and then the resurrection. And when he rose on that third day from the grave, he became the glory of God's image. The glory of God's image. So no longer wearing a, a crown of thorns, but instead, you know, has a, a halo, right? A crown of glory. So the hat represents the halo. We recognize Jesus is the head of the entire body. So if Jesus is the head of the body, he is the head of the nation. King of kings, Lord of lords, God of gods. He is the word of God. And that's what all this is about. So this is a physical representation of what is going on in the spiritual world. Let's say that, right? So we got my eyes of fire, and if you could see closely into my eyes, you would see a reflection, a mirror reflection. In fact, if you were standing right here, you would see your own Reflection. How does the kingdom of God work? I'm going to explain the revelation of salvation to you in a very simple way, in a way that each and every person can understand and should be able to receive without doubt or question. So we see like in the book of Revelation, right, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we see, that's what I see in the book of Revelation, the revelation given to John by angels. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. The, the, the removal of any and all mysteries that may be surrounding <coughs> the Messiah and God. It, it is the unveiling of it, the revelation of it. And Jesus is a spirit of 
revelation. This is how the kingdom of heaven works. This is how the kingdom of heaven is being manifested here in our world, in our lives. And it's up to us to believe it. And once we believe it, we'll be able to see it, to grab hold of it, and then make it our own. You know, everybody, right? including myself, everybody is waiting for Christ to return. But what does that mean? What will that look like? What will that be like? Well, first of all, we know that everybody, everywhere, every eye shall see it. Nobody's going to have to say, look, there it is, there it is happening, because every eye will see it. Everybody is going to notice it. Just as lightning strikes in the east, it can also be seen in the west. Here I am somewhere in the world and through the power of light. You are receiving and seeing this message today. No matter where you are, you may be in the far east, sitting there in some islands in the Philippines. You could be as far north as you can go, somewhere up there in Canada. You could be over there somewhere in England, or you could be someplace in, the, in South America, or even here inside of the United States. All seeing and hearing the same thing at the same moment. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. And we belong to an extremely peculiar generation. Unlike any other generation that ever, has ever come before us, we are part of a peculiar generation, a generation of people that have been set apart from all the rest of all generations that have ever been here in this world. Can we believe it? Can we wrap our, our minds around it? This is the life of Jesus Christ. That's what this is about. And you being the temple of God. So we see in the book of Revelation that the kingdom of heaven is, is going to come down from heaven, from above. And, and it's going to come and, and rest within this world. And, and people are, are going to be coming to the kingdom to see and meet with God. And the only way to come to God, right, is through Jesus Christ. There is no other way that anyone can come to God unless they come through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the glory of God's image. God in flesh. So, when God says to Ezekiel thousands of years ago, that there's going to come a day and there's going to come a generation of people who I am going to place within them my own spirit. And I'm going to give them a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. I'm going to write my law, my statutes, and my precepts upon their own hearts. That's the thing with Jesus Christ. He is the living Torah. The word Torah means to as an archer, and he's shooting, hitting the mark. So if an archer is shooting at the bullseye at a target, and he hits the bullseye dead center, that is Torah, hitting the mark. It also can be received or known as the teachings and instructions of God. Not the teachings and instructions of men, but the teachings and instructions of God. Of God.
Can we receive it? Can we believe it? We come to God first <laughs> recognizing and confessing that we have fallen short of the glory of God and in that we, it, it humbly brings us to our knees and, and there we're trying to rebuild, rebuild our courage, our strength, our stamina, our ability to rise up and, and look upon the face of God. If we seek the face of God, surely we shall see it. Because God wants to be known. God does not want to be a mystery, but he wants to be known. And, and the first thing we know about God or come to know about God through the revelation of Jesus Christ is that he is our father. He is our dad. Right? In the beginning, we are given an invitation. Right? So in the beginning of the book of Revelation, he gives you a new name written on a white stone. And that white stone, unblemished. A new name, a new identity, a, a new person no longer being defined as sin or a sinner or inadequate, but a new name, a name only known by you and God. And each one of you know these names, actually all the people here on here, and this will all make sense when we get done, but every person here on my ephod, right, David, made for himself an ephod of, of, made of cloth. Now the high priest back in, in thousands of years ago in the days of Moses had an ephod and that was like a chest protector and it had 12 stones on there representing the 12 stones of Israel. Each one of them stones had a name to represent each tribe, so one stone and, and, you know, they, it, it was made of a precious stone. We can go back, read in, in the book of Leviticus to see what all that looks like. But one for Reuben. One stone for Judah. Right? A stone for Joseph. One stone for Levi. One stone for Simeon. Right, and here we have new stones in each person and you have a new name. No longer being represented by the nation of Israel. Instead, we, God knows us personally, each individual. This is why your name is known by God and it's a personal name that only he and you know. So you get this invitation. This is like receiving a, a, an invitation, right? It gives you the stone in, in the same way uh, uh, you're going to send out invitations to a wedding, right? A wedding, and you're the bride. You're the guest of honor at the wedding, Christ Jesus Christ is the bridegroom, the husband. I will seek you as a groom seeks out his bride. I will create within you a yearning. A yearning. Cannot be satisfied, cannot find fulfillment <clears throat> until or unless the bride comes or the groom comes to fulfill the bride's yearning. And, and then the yearning is taken away, and then you're able to be satisfied. All right? Gives you a new name written on a white stone, a stone without blemish. You, you are identified, your identity, your value, 
comes from God. Comes from God. My child. Father. Our Father defines us. Our, def our, our integrity. Our character. Whatever it is that defines us it is coming from our Father. Right? And, and Jesus Christ who is our father, is our husband, is the Messiah, is the son. God our father and Jesus Christ his son. They are one. And there is not three gods. There is one God. One God. And I'm trying to explain to you in a physical form, in a physical way, the spiritual realm. Right? This suit, like Joseph's suit of many colors, was given to him by his father Israel. And it was a statement to all people around, including his 11 brothers and his one sister, that this is my favorite. In this son, I, I find my pride and my joy. This one is my favorite. And why was he Jacob's favorite? Well, he came from Rachel, the woman he loved. He loved and, and cherished Rachel. And, and Leah kind of was came in as trickery. <laughs> it was never his desire to marry Leah, even though he had lots of children with Leah. <laughs> Rachel was the one he desired. Rachel, in Rachel, he, he saw no spot or blemish because he, he generally loved her from the depths of his own heart. Now, Rachel had a hard time believing that. But she had two children, Joseph and Benjamin, right? And said, because she died giving birth to Benjamin, that this is the son of my troubles. In giving birth to this son, I died. Son of my troubles. Jacob says, I will not name him the son of your troubles. Instead, I will name him the son of my right hand. It's interesting, Paul was a Benjaminite. He started out as a son of trouble, but later became the son of God's right hand. From him, we learned many revelations. From him, the revelation of salvation became a reality. No longer a son of trouble, instead a son of great strength. And as Paul began to say, I was crucified with Jesus Christ there at Golgotha. I no longer live, but Christ now lives in me. And that's what this is all about. So the high priest, Moses' time, right, has the 12 tribes right here on the ephod on the chest so that when he would go in once a year, Yom Kippur, go in once a year, every year, to make an atonement for the sins of Israel. And he'd go in behind the Holy of Holies, right inside of the temple or inside of the tabernacle, instructed by God to create and make. The Holy of Holies, and, and make an atonement for the sins of the people, right? This, this was something that was done 
by the priests as an instructions of God to do for the people. It wasn't that the people had to do something in order to receive the atonement. This was a gift by God for the people because their sins were many. And yet, it was not God's desire, our Father's desire, to destroy any of them, but it was his desire to save them. It was his desire to deliver them. It was his desire to rescue them. So in all of this, this is a gift given to us by God. Right? And the... So they were a reminder to the priests that these people, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Abraham, were precious stones in the eyes of God. That's why they were 12 precious stones. And then Jesus gives us a, a new stone, a white stone, with our names on it. Precious in the eyes of of God. We see in the book of Revelation that when the kingdom of heaven was going to come down, we would be able to identify the kingdom of heaven because of the precious stones that it was made of. Starting with the foundation, and, and we'll get into this even though I have a suit of many colors, yeah, God is probably not walking around with rainbow legs. But it's not about rainbow legs. It's about what they represent. And I'll show that to you in just a moment. It's about what it represents. You understand? It, it's a, a physical thing that we could look upon that identifies what's going on in the spiritual realm. It's what it represents. And, and the foundation of God's kingdom is built upon these precious stones. And each one of them stones has the names of all the apostles, the 12 apostles written upon it. And then above those stones are stones of, of many different colors. And again, those are all precious stones chosen by God, right? These aren't stones that we have made or created. When John saw the revelation of the kingdom of Christ, this was what God has chosen to make and what God has chosen to reveal to us. These are chosen, precious in the eyes of God. <clears throat> we are those stones, right? So each one of these stones are real people that I've met within my life, all throughout my life, throughout my ministry. People who had an impact on my growth in my life. And, and, and it's all there and, and their representation of precious in the eyes of God. God is using each one of us putting them together to create a, a new temple, right? And, and the temple is God's living space. That's where God lives. God lives inside the temple behind the Holy of Holies, right? And the priests would come in and interact with God in that way, sprinkling the blood, the blood of the lamb, the blood of bulls and goats, and the atonement was to look upon the slain animal, recognizing and understanding that what happened to that animal was it was slain. It was innocent. It was void of sin. What happened to the animal is what should have happened to me. That's the punishment I deserve for the sins I have committed. And when you look upon it, and see that an innocent being has lost its life only to sustain my life. 
Same with the Lamb. We see the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, that was slain. Everything he received, we should have received. We should have received the wrath of God because the effects of my sins were so great. But Jesus took on that wrath for our well-being so that we could live, so we could be rescued. And God was satisfied. His anger was satisfied with that so that he could come into our lives creating for us a new life. So we're, we're taking off <clears throat> the old man, the man who lives as according to slander. We're taking off the old man who lives as according to judging others, condemning others. We're, we're taking off the old man who cannot save himself. And we're putting on the new man. And, and this is what it looks like and, and it represents. Let us recognize that, you know, they had in the Jewish religion hand washing. And you would, at, at this point in, in the juncture of, of our walk, you know, and I got this wonderful stuff from Israel and actually remember buying this and I still have some left, not a lot, but I still got some. And, and there's this young woman, I went to the mall shopping years ago, you know, and there I got my little boy with me and he's about five, six years old, running around the mall and just keeping me very busy, and, you know, and you're chasing your kid around and oh, get out of there, no, I can't buy that, I can't have that. Blah, 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 walking down the mall, and, and this Jewish girl who had a very heavy accent, and you could tell she was from Israel, comes in, grabs hold of me. Come here, I, I want to wash your hands. No, I don't want to wash my hands. My, I'm clean. I had just taken a shower before we went shopping, had clean clothes on, feeling good, feeling fresh, clean, and I don't, I don't need my hands washed. You guys just sound a bunch of woman stuff, right? This is for women, not for me. And yet, the Israelites send out spies, religious spies, right? We, we learned that back in, in the book of Joshua. They send out these religious spies and kind of surveying the land and surveying the people. What is life like for you? And, and then this, this, this lady comes and, I want to wash your hands for you with the stuff. And I ended up buying the stuff because, I don't know, maybe it's God speaking to me through her. So finally she convinces me to wash my hands. And so we use this little stuff and I'm washing my hands. And she's pouring the water upon my hands. My hands are clean. Right? Look into this white bowl as I'm washing my hands. And, and it, it's black. Dirty. I mean, that stuff right there really cleans you. <laughs> It really cleans you. It cleans you up good. That's Dead Sea Salt with some uh, oil and stuff from Israel in it. And what kind of oil, what kind of stuff, I don't know. You know, I'm not very smart in that area, but the point is, I said my hands are clean. And I believed they were clean. And physically, they looked clean. But when I washed them, they were dirty. And I felt ashamed. I felt embarrassed. Here's this beautiful girl from Israel. And she was beautiful from Israel, there with her heavy accent, talking to me. And I, now I'm feeling embarrassed. Like, Jesus, my hands are black. 
dirty and the water is black and nasty and whoa, I, I could see it. And, and she could see it. I was a little embarrassed. That's kind of our world, right? We as Christians and people who come to God and surely God chose to save me because I'm good. I'm righteous and I'm holy and I am clean. I am spotless and I'm without blemish. Yet, if we'd only recognize we have dirt on our hands. In other words, we got blood on our hands and we have the blood of Jesus Christ on our hands because the answer to our sins is Jesus Christ crucified and every time we engage in sin in our lives, whatever it is, we are subjecting Jesus Christ to public shame all over again, crucifying him daily. <coughs> Each and every day, crucifying him all over again. Every time we slander our neighbor, we're crucifying and subjecting Jesus Christ to crucifixion. My hands are bloody because I was there on the day he was crucified, and I'm the one swinging the hammer, nailing him to the cross. And the only way we're gonna bring that, we're gonna change, the only way we're gonna stop making him suffer we're going to stop crucifying him is when we recognize and admit my hands are dirty. And if I really loved Jesus Christ, it's not about me dancing and praising God. It's about me stopping the pain. And the only way I can stop the pain is to stop swinging the hammer by recognizing my hands are bloody. My hands are are dirty. Every time I judge my neighbor and I try to condemn my neighbor, my hands are dirty. Every time I engage in gossip and I'm gossiping about my neighbors, my hands are dirty. Every day I live in debauchery and drunkenness and I continue to hurt and violate my family because of my drunkenness, my hands are dirty. If I would only admit it is by the power of my own actions, I am in a place of suffering. My hands are dirty. You know, this is a powerful message. Even though I look like a clown, I'm telling you, this is a powerful message. It is powerful. And it can bring healing into your lives. Because there's many people, there's probably 80% of all Christians have been molested somewhere in their lives. And I'm not saying they were molested by the church or Christian folks. They're probably molested by an uncle, an aunt, a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, somebody within your own family. And if you haven't been molested or exposed to sexual immorality, You were abused by a father who was an alcoholic, a mother who was a drug addict, an aunt or an uncle who was subjected to some sort of addiction. They loved the addiction more than the person or the people whom God surrounded them with. Right? Joseph had the coat the suit, the covering of many colors, but was abused and violated by his own family members as they threw him down 
into the well, a cistern. The later was drawn up and sold into slavery. Right? Jesus Christ was thrown <laughs> into the ground and then later was rose up into a place of like slavery. Right? Servant of all servants. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, then you'll be a servant. Not just a servant, but the servant of all servants. Sometimes we don't recognize that God, we, we want God in through prayer and all of our stuff and, and our actions. We want God to serve us. He's like our servant. Get this for me. Get that for me. Do this for me. Do that for me. That's, that's us. That's what a person who owns servants, who owns slaves, does. They tell their slaves what to do. Cook me food. Bring me some water. Bring me this. Bring me that. And a good servant obeys his master. And all the while, I believe God is waiting for us to believe. We are here to serve him. And how are we going to serve him? We're going to serve him by pleasing him. How do we please him? By laying the hammer down. Laying down the destructive tools that are subjecting our Lord and our Savior to crucifixion. First, we got to admit our hands are dirty. And the reality is, and this is a religious ritual, you can wash your hands, it's great, you know, it's Jesus Christ washes us in his own blood. Only so we can see the effects of our own actions. I, you know, I felt so ashamed. When, when that girl could see the truth, I mean, I, I was clean. I was without blemish, right? That's what we all want everybody to believe in this world. We are without sin. But the reality is, when Christ washes us, we can, everybody can see the dirt. And, and, and it should make us feel ashamed. Because it is the shame that's going to create the desire to change. People who have been struggling with childhood abuse, no matter what form of abuse they have been struggling with, they, they grow up to be adults. Yet they don't want to admit I was abused and, and the abuse had a negative effect on my life and, and the negative effect on my life is shown through by depression. My inability to believe I had chosen precious in the eyes of God and my inability to believe I'm worthy of something good. My inability to believe that I have value, I have purpose. My inability to believe that God can love me, love me so intently that he would be willing to call me my child, my baby. 
That's the effects of sin. And, and they create within us a, a blindness. I can't believe in God, His love, His grace, His mercy. I can't believe God would create me in His own image. And, and it's for that reason Jesus Christ comes to us as a humble servant. Jesus Christ comes to us in the form of God, yet never claiming to be God. That's why Jesus Christ comes to us covered in blood, with a crown of thorns. That's, that's us, right? We're, we're covered in blood in blood and our crown of thorns are all the things and the people and all the stuff that stuck to us as Paul says I, there's these messengers of the devil that come to me and they are like a thorn in my flesh the thorn in my flesh is my inability to escape the depression the inability to stop remembering the pain and the sufferings and the abuses I endured as a child, the messengers of the devil. And yet Jesus says to Paul, My grace is efficient for you. My grace is efficient for you. My grace, my love, is efficient for you. In the same way, we are a thorn in Christ's crown. But we don't want to no longer be a thorn in the crown of Christ. Because it brings pain. It brings suffering. And we want to be a part of the glory of God. the glory of God's image. And that's what this is about. So we got the royal blue, and the royal blue reminds us that we have been called by God to be a part of a royal priesthood. We are the sons and the daughters of the prophets. We are the sons and the daughters of the priests. We are the sons and the daughters of Abraham. So long as we believe in the promise. Jesus Christ is the promise. The promise is that one day I will come and rebuild you. Using you as a precious stone for my new temple. That's going to come down from heaven into this world. Transforming it from dark to light. Walk in the light because God is in the light. And so long as we're walking in the light, the truth, we are walking with God. So let us sit down and let me start again to show you the steps. It's a process. And if you're willing to engage in the process, willing to be a part of the teachings and instructions that are of God, he will begin removing that heart of stone and, and re replacing it with his own spirit so that we can walk around in this world, in the glory of God's image, no longer a fallen man, but a risen man, risen for the glory of God. So let us go and sit down and talk about this. Ooh. All right.
so we've washed our hands, we've gotten past that stage. We recognize we have problems in our life and we're wanting to be a part of the restoration of our lives. Jesus Christ wants to, wants to deliver you, wants to restore you. So it comes in right here. Let's talk about it. All right, first of all, right, we got the Jasper Stone. We got James, the name of James. And we have the Jasper Stone faith, having faith, right? And it's not about just having faith, recognizing and understanding that because of the abuse we received as children, or wherever it was somewhere in our lives, our ability to believe in faith, to believe in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ or God was broken. So there was some sort of a fracture here within our lives and we recognize that it's broken, but it can be fixed. Again, God is going to place within us his own spirit and his own spirit is faithful. The steadfast love of God is believable. We can place our faith in there. As James says, we, we cannot be a, a person of doubt because if we're a person of doubt, we're like a person out in the ocean on a boat without a rudder, right? And so we're just being tossed to and fro from the waves. Satan comes and says to God, right? Jesus was standing there and says, I want to toss Peter like the, the chaff in the wind, right? And uh, so if we were separating the chaff from the seed back in the old days, you know, and you'd have all your seed and, and the stuff in, in like a blanket or, or something and you're gonna fling it up and, and, and the chaff being light, lighter than the seed, it's gonna hit the wind and begin to blow out until only the seed is left. But for how long will the devil, you know, be sifting the wheat with Peter? It's constantly, you know, up and down, up and down. And, and that's what doubt does. One moment uh, I'm ready to believe, and the next moment I can't believe. And, and so I'm up and down, up and down. A lot of people who struggle with depression, it's the same thing. One day I'm up, ready to live life, and the next day I'm down. Can't believe I have life. And so we're constantly up and down. That's a place that's lacking in faith, right? We talked a little bit in the last video about faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. This is a gift from God to you. And that is your ability to believe. We cannot believe on our own. We must have the Spirit of God within our own hearts creating the faith. The faith of Jesus Christ being alive within us. Right? That's what's going to make us whole. That's what the foundation it is all resting on faith. It's, it's the beginning. Next it is the, uh, see we got the Jasper. We have the, uh, hold on, let's see here. I got it all written down. The Sapphire Stone, and on that we got Jane, or John's name, right? And we put James and John, because they were like brothers. And they said, you know, as they went into a, a town or a place that had rejected Jesus and said, oh, go away from us. We're afraid of you and we don't want you here. So James and John said, 
Should we pray to God to blow down fireballs from heaven and consume them in the same way he did with Sodom and Gomorrah? Jesus rebukes them and says, stop what you're doing, knock it off. I did not come into this world to destroy them. I came here to save them. And that's the same for us. It's recognizing and placing our faith in, in a good God who has no desire to destroy us. He does not take pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. Instead, he finds great pleasure in the wicked who turn from evil, turning to him. He takes great pleasure in the salvation of each one of us. And so, uh, sorry, it's kind of hard to read here. Integrity, right? The sapphire represents integrity. So it is by faith in Jesus Christ, God begins to create within us a new identity which comes by the power of our integrity, right? Integrity is the things that create within us the, what defines us, right? It's our own actions that define us. Words don't define us, but our actions define us, and that's, also what James says, faith without deed is dead. And that's the same with Jesus Christ. His faithfulness, having faith in God is one thing, but absent of the deeds, it would be dead. And the deed was, I came into this world to give you eternal life. So faith and the deed or what create in us a desire to be better people, a desire to let go of the hatred, the anger, the disappointment. You know, that's the thing. A lot of us who have been abused as children hold within our heart grudge, anger, resentment, an unwillingness to forgive those who hurt us and to violate us, right? And so we got to begin to look at letting go of those things. And then next we have the Caledonian stone, right? Got Peter written on there. Innocence and sacrificial love. innocence and sacrificial love. We should be coming to God as innocent children, right? He says, suffer these children. They are innocent. They have neither done right or wrong. They're just children trying to discover this life, this world, and their place within this life and world. And Jesus says, if you receive any of them as being mine, you are receiving me. You know, somewhere in life we, we've lost, you know, because of the abuse, we've lost our faith. We've lost our, our integrity, right? We, we lie, we cheat, we steal. And we want to turn away from those things and return to a place where we can be seen as a, an ambassador for God here in this world. And, and it begins through this and placing this again, this is it's physical. We can look upon it and you can see in me, you can see it, right? On me, in me, my legs of many colors, but we're going to it's a physical form or symbolism for what's going on in the spiritual as God is placing within us 
his own spirit, his own laws, his own statutes and precepts, right? The 613 statutes and precepts that define holiness. And that's Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of all those things. Sacrificial love, we've lost our ability to, to be a part of sacrificial love. Right? We'll get more into that on the next video. We'll start right there. Sacrificial love, as Jesus Christ shows and demonstrates to us the sacrificial love of God there on the cross. You know, even though our hands were dirty and were covered in the blood of the Lamb, which means we're participating in, in the destruction of Jesus Christ, the destruction of, of his image. He stands back silently. Like a lamb being led to the slaughter. He stands back in complete silence. That's sacrificial love. This is, this is love, and, and this is the, 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 the definition of biblical love. Yet while we were sinning, yet while we were participating in the destruction of Jesus Christ, he forgave us. He died for us. That is love. And we ought to be willing to do the same for our brothers and our sisters. So sacrificial love is a gift. Love is a sacrifice. It's not a demand. But a sacrifice. It's a gift. And being able to believe in the sacrificial love of God, that's faith. And this is how we're going to begin to begin to rebuild our integrity. Forgiving those who hurt us. In order for us to take upon the glory of God's image, we must forgive as Christ has forgiven. And, and we can go in and, and we'll get in, because here we are at step three, we'll go in and we'll start talking about Samson. And, and, and the things we can learn from Samson's story. Right? We, we, we can learn that Samson was a man of revenge. He had troubles with self-control. And all those things began and kept on hurting himself. So our desire for revenge hurts only ourself. Our, our lack of of self-control only hurts ourself. Our inability to, to forgive those who have hurt and harmed us only hurts ourself. And, and that's why we're in a place of brokenness. We're in a place of depression. Because the things we're thinking things we are doing are actually hurting ourselves, And we can't begin to be a part of that sacrificial love unless we're willing to give it away. And we have to forgive. We have to forgive our child molesters. We have to forgive our alcoholic parents who may have hurt and violated us. 
We have to forgive those who became our enemies. Loving them in the same way we desire to be loved. Even if they don't have the ability to do it. This is about the restoration of your life. And it's possible because nothing is impossible for God. And that includes restoring you. So come and join me in the next video as we go through Samson's story, seeing what we can learn from his mistakes so that we can come to God before we lose our eyesight, before we lose everything. As he sacrificed everything, including his life, his eyes, and everything he held dear to him in order to receive the goodness of God in his life. Let that not be you. Okay, guys, I will see you next time.